Okay, welcome to the Not an Agent channel, a weekly show about real estate with a particular focus on issues impacting Canadian real estate. We are not, not financial advisors. Please consult your financial advisor before making any investment decisions. Don't make your decisions based off YouTube videos. Rule Good number job, one. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> My reading skills are intact. So the first topic we were going to talk about is full schools. So we're seeing this in Vancouver, in Calgary, Winnipeg, across large portions of Canada. We're seeing full schools. So cl classroom sizes have reached the breaking point. Uh, we're finding that we, and sometimes it's localized in areas of affordability. So housing affordability is really shoehorned people into certain neighborhoods and those neighborhoods, uh, they, they don't have the infrastructure for, uh, to, to house children for schools right now. Um, so they, you're having to, you're having to bring your children a few neighborhoods over sometimes to the other side of the city. Uh, and really if, if you've, in the Vancouver case, if you've got, bought a condo and you want that condo lifestyle where everything's walkable and all of a sudden you have to drive your kid uh, you know, half an hour in the morning across the city to bring them to a school, that really impacts your lifestyle and it, it really changes the aspect of the investment that you've made. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's just hugely disruptive. I mean, yeah, getting the kids ready to work, uh, to go to school and you getting ready for work and, you know, uh, both parents working, you know, two or three kids going to school, going to different levels of school, elementary, middle, just a complete nightmare. If like having kids close to schools is a great luxury. Like if you can have your kids walk to school, right. it makes everything easier. So mm -hmm. as far as predictions go, is this, it doesn't seem like this is going to be an easy fix. There's no easy solutions. It has to do with, uh, funding the budgets of the schools. I don't think this is going to go away anytime soon. I, I don't think so either. I, I feel like uh, our population is increasing. It's not, uh, it's not dwindling. And so we're, we're just, we're going to need more schools. And uh, unless uh, we have a children of men situation where people stop being born, uh, it's just going to continue to be a, an issue. It's going to continue to be a hot button. Uh, you know, politicians probably love it when these when these uh, small booms and children going through school and you know pushing them to the to the breaking point uh, happen because it, it makes for uh, it makes for a very polarizing subject uh, in, in each individual neighborhood. Yeah, and I mean we need we need young people. We need kids to pay for our retirements basically are <laughs> unfunded as liabilities um, as we're paying for our parents right now <laughs> exactly so we need the young people we need the immigrants bringing the young people bringing yeah. the kids in but this is an example of it's not all uh it's not as simple as oh we need them they're good for there's costs to this you know you yeah. bring in a bunch of immigrants with their kids, great, we need those people, but it's a strain on the healthcare system sometimes, the school system, there's a lot of extra baggage that comes with that. Yes, absolutely. So the next one was kind of connected, unreasonable commutes. So we're talking about getting your kids to school, but now we're talking about their parents and getting to work. So again, you can imagine if you've got to get your kids to school at what is it eight eight thirty, but then you've got an hour commute, so you've got to get out of the house an hour early to get to your job. How does that work? Well, it's it's quite interesting to to hear about this particular story because we were we were talking about this last week actually, like how how far is reasonable to drive, and the BC uh, Civil Resolutions Tribunal has actually said driving from Abbotsford is not unreasonable. And they actually ruled in favor of a condo strata. And someone got a 22, I think it's $22,000 fine uh, from the strata because of the uh, 
because they tried to rent out their condo that's underwater that made them financially insolvent to sell it. Uh, and they, you know, they'd moved closer to their new job in Vancouver. So, um, you know, in, in the eyes of the court, Abbotsford to Vancouver, it's not too far to drive, but in the eyes of any sane person, it probably is. Cause that's uh, about you, an hour. It's an hour. If the nothing messes up on the highway. Okay. Which always happens. <laughs> okay. So the average would be maybe hour and a half, hour and a half, hour 15, somewhere in there, I would say. Okay. So some bodies are saying that that's reasonable. You and I would probably say that's unreasonable. Although there's a ton of people that have hour, hour and a half commutes, mm -hmm. uh, all over the lower mainland, uh, Calgary, Edmonton. Yeah. There's a lot of people doing really long commutes. It's true. Some people would prefer to live in the country, but have to make their living in the city. Uh, yeah. Or they, they can't afford driving. in the city. Right, exactly. And some people like to drive. Some people uh, like every to drive. Every day for but two hours. If you, if you asked all the drivers what percent are saying, I love the drive into work, and what percent are like, I have to do the drive to work, I would say like... Right. The, the amount of people that love to do the, the, the drive is probably like a single digit percentage. Yeah, absolutely. And when you take a look at uh, some of the people that are uh, commuting even from uh, Vancouver Island to work in Vancouver, or maybe they're living in Whistler and working in Vancouver, that's a lot of miles. That's uh, that, that wears on your body. It wears on your psyche. Yeah. Uh, it wears on your family, really, because you're, you're not around for that extra amount of time for the commute um, oh yeah yeah no it's like the only upside is you can keep up with your podcasts and audiobooks right. uh, the one thing i did mention in one of my videos about how things might change and it depends on what side of the uh, uh self-driving car debate you're on but my theory is i do think it's gonna come uh fairly soon the self-driving cars uh and then the commute is a lot more bearable can you imagine if you're in a self-driving car you throw on netflix or you put the laptop in front of you you're doing work on the way to work um mm -hmm. you're relaxing maybe sleeping you know i think right. that changes the game but it depends on what side of that there's a lot of people that that dismiss self-driving cars as it's never going to happen mm-hmm but I think well, that would maybe. be a, that would be a game changer because living out in Abbotsford an hour away and you get to commute in your own little bubble, I think a, the the percentage of people that love the commute would go from single digits to like maybe over fifty percent because you get this you're in the car you're commuting you get to just have alone time you don't have mm -hmm. like the family in your ears you just get to like have this hour commute where you can just do whatever you want basically you know it's it's interesting when the bus strikes were happening uh my uh somebody was on on the sky train that day when the when the west coast express broke down or when it didn't break down when it was stopped for the day and uh they said that a lot of people came onto the sky train that day that would normally take the west coast express from the same stop so I'd be really interested to hear what uh, everyone thinks about commuter rail versus uh, versus an urban transit system like a like a uh, an LRT system like SkyTrain or SeaTrain. I'd like to hear what your thoughts are on uh, the comfort level of an actual proper commuter train versus an LRT train, and whether or not that makes your commute more more uh, more bearable in in an instance where it might be an hour drive or an hour train. Uh, which would you prefer? Yeah, I can. I'm guessing most people would prefer the train. I guess the downside of the trains is if you're you're changing trains, uh, right. but I, you're not doing that so much in the lower mainland. No, no, no it's a straight shot for the most part. So if you've got an opinion on that, leave it in the comments. And if you have an opinion on if self-driving cars are actually going to happen, leave that in the comments. So I think we'll get flying cars before we get self-driving cars. Oh yeah. All right. Be little it. mini airports everywhere. Leave that in the comments. Because 
it's too big an issue to get into this. Maybe that would be an issue, uh, uh, interesting thing, because I've made videos about it. Because the other thing it, it does, the self-driving cars changes so much. It's a huge game changer because parking lots. You don't need parking lots. Because if you've got the, the Uber of, of car services, you don't need to park it. You call the car, it takes you to the place. You don't need to park it at Walmart. It drops you off when you need to get out. It'll know you're leaving Walmart. It'll come pick you up. You don't need mm -hmm. these massive parking lots. You don't need these Robin's parking stalls, basically. So it's yeah. a, and uh, traffic congestion. And my big thing is it will make the uh, surrounding communities uh, around the centers much more palatable. It'll it'll yes. it'll be. But that's another show. The next thing we're going to talk in this show is the shadow banks too big to ignore so this is uh shadow banks alt lending what are the names are there uh private equity well not private equity private lending shadow banks um alternative lending yeah i think yeah, people, so. people know what they those are so if you can't get your mortgage at your royal bank your td any of these big major national banks your mortgage broker will direct you to or could potentially direct you to some of these alternative lenders because I'm you'd know better than I would. That's how you would find an alt lender in most cases. Like people, like yeah. how else would you find some of these niche lending uh, solutions? They're starting to advertise pretty hard in Metro Vancouver. You can find it on the, uh, some of the bus shacks are starting to say bank didn't approve you. Come talk to us. So it's it's starting to become more mainstream, which is interesting. And uh, I, I think the, that the uh, our, our regulatory bodies are starting to take notice of that, that it's not just a small uh, niche solution anymore. Now as house prices are rising, more people are having to go to these alternate lenders. Um, I have an anecdote from a realtor that I was talking with. Uh, he had a client who was closing on a house. And they, for whatever reason, the, the mortgage uh, company went forward the mortgage for them and uh, or went forward the funds. So they had to go with an alt lender for a year. Um, so it's it really is becoming more mainstream as people are feeling the crunch of, uh, of purchase price versus their income. Right. And that's called like a bridge loan where you've got like a, a year loan with an alt lender and that will get you into hopefully... Uh, a more mainstream lender next year, basically. Yeah, you're you're looking at a well, it's a, it's an open mortgage for the year. Um, okay. Bridge is another uh, topic, but we can we can link to to the differences between the two. Um, so yeah, so your your open mortgage, it's basically saying, okay, you can pay this off anytime you need to, uh, but here's your here's your one year term. Uh, so and but the, I guess the interest rate would generally be much higher. Yeah, it's a lot higher. You're you're looking maybe like 5% higher, which uh, makes your payments incredibly. Yeah. So you, you don't want to stay in that for a long period of time, and that, that's part of the reason why why it's that high. Um, now, the interesting thing about these uh, alternative mortgages is they're often coming from individuals. It's not uh, it's not coming from a corporation, per se. So, it, like, if you if you had, you know, $50,000 sitting around and you, you wanted to lend it, you could give me a mortgage for 50 k mortgage broker you could do that yourself or a mortgage broker could put it together for you uh, hmm. people are limited to how many loans they can make in a year before they have to get their brokerage license but um you know it's it's a good way to make uh seven eight percent on your on your investment especially if you can get yourself as first mortgage on title of the house there, there might be some some issues collecting if uh if you if the person defaults on the mortgage which we're seeing happening quite a bit now we'll talk about that a little later uh, but it, it is, uh, it, it's becoming increasingly attractive for people buying homes to, to use these alt lenders because of the, because of the housing prices. Yeah. And, and uh, we were talking earlier, um, and we were talking about this, uh, TD was putting together, uh, mortgage backed securities made up of alt lenders. Mm -hmm. And we were, we were trying, we were discussing all the many implications and and uh, uh points about it and uh one of them i was thinking is maybe the major banks are seeing that um 
the alt lending space is is exploding. Well, I don't know. It's it's gaining more market share. They want a piece of that. So TD is. <laughs> Alexa, stop. <laughs> <laughs> Twelve o'clock. I'm gonna li- I'm gonna leave that in. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, uh, anyways, so TD is seeing that the alt alt lending space is taking off, and my theory was that they're trying to get a taste, so they're they're um, packaging these alt lending mortgages, which mm-hmm. should sound kind of scary to anybody who knows what happened in the United States uh, a decade ago. Yes. Yeah, so definitely something to watch, and uh, you know as. As uh, citizens, that where if our financial system fails, everyone's going to feel the pain. And you, I, I would encourage everybody to keep a close eye on that, uh, especially if you have uh, if you have an interest in how stocks are being rated. Uh, it, it's very important to not allow these uh, mortgage-backed uh, securities to to start taking on poorly rated. Poorly rated uh, mortgages, because if that happens, people start defaulting. It's it's disaster. Yeah, and the thing is, you uh, like in the big short, they kind of uh, uh, put a light on. Is the rating agencies are competing against each other? Uh, So if they won't rate it AAA or whatever they want, they'll just go down the street. So the thing is they the one of the points of that movie or that actual real life incident was that it took somebody to really look inside those and see what the what what was making up all those mortgages and right. if you've just got a slapped a triple a rating on it you don't know until you open the package and see what's inside it was those people who opened the package and took a look at what's inside that shorted it so right. the question in Canada is, what is it like? Maybe it's not that bad, but maybe it's bad. You know, mm-hmm. we don't know. Mm-hmm. So the next one we were going to talk about is sold for half. And you were telling me about this. So I'll let you go into that one. Uh, so there, there was, if you recall from, uh, I think it was about a year ago now, uh, there was a student who owned a $3 million mansion, a student. Um, and sold it to another party, and that party didn't complete the sale. Uh, so a judge granted damages to the to the student uh, and the, to the effect of five mansions that this other person owned. Five mansions, um, or, or maybe properties, but they're you know highly priced properties at any rate. Uh, so one of these one of these mansions is the property uh, in question here, but. They're, leading up to this, the banks weren't able to find this person to serve them. So the courts gave the bank uh, permission to serve via email. And they've gone through the foreclosure proceedings. February 14th, they took the house uh, and then they've sold it. Now, uh, I think the, the house originally sold for around $3, three million. Um, the, and the, uh, the company that... Uh, foreclosed on them was owed around 20, 27. Uh, originally, that was the original loan, or 2.7 million rather. That was the original sum of the loans. Uh, they just sold it yesterday. Uh, the house sold for uh, 2.1 million, I believe. So it's you know it's below the original purchase price, below the amount of the loans that were taken out. So somebody's underwater here. And if you look at the title, uh, the title for this property. There's not just one mortgage on this property. There's multiple mortgages. Money's been shifted around a bunch of times. So now, when when you look at when you look at your previous video, Daniel, when you're with the uh, you know the top top end pushing all the prices down, right? Mm-hmm. So this is a three million dollar house that was valued at four million that now sold for two million. Mm-hmm. Okay. So when we're talking about homes, a lot of the benchmark that we say is, you know, anything under two million is affordable, mm-hmm. and really that's what's moving right now. So we've just pushed that ceiling down quite a bit. Mm-hmm. Um, you're you're getting that house. Uh, I think I think it's in Shaughnessy, but it's it's a big mansion. It looks nice, um, and it just sold for two million. So who's going to pay two million for a teardown house now? 
quick correction after reviewing that. Uh, I don't want to leave you with an incorrect impression. So the uh, the mansion was originally put up for sale for $8 million in 2016, and it was sold for half of that at about $4.4 million, uh, just a few days ago. And the amount of the loans that were outstanding that were granted not outstanding were 2.15 million and point th- uh, well 350,000 for reliable mortgages. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, the other thing we were talking about with this is uh, how the bank did. Like if they had the down payment and they'd been making mortgage payments, maybe the bank was made whole with the two million dollar sale. Maybe, but if you look at the amounts of money that have been borrowed against it, um, th- there would have had to be some very large balloon payments. So, they, so the bank was probably down. just trying to get out with what they could. Yeah, and when banks try to get out with what they can, that's a domino. Right, right. Because if they had if they had confidence in the market, specifically this segment of the market, this is like the high end, they would. They wouldn't just take 2.1 million or whatever it was. They would wait. Or, or if they had any sort of resiliency, right? So that is one to watch. Well, everybody's watching that one to see what the the top end of the market if it's going to push down on the rest of the market. Uh, so the next one we're going to talk about is Berlin rent freeze. I think maybe most people have probably seen this. So what uh what's going on there so in in berlin they they've frozen rents for uh 1.5 million apartments Uh, so when the berlin wall came down east berlin was was very much uh, a low rent uh, area where artists would go uh, really a cultural mecca for that reason um and you know as as time goes on and with with things that have been happening in the world uh Property prices have been skyrocketing, so the uh, they they put a rent freeze in place to keep things affordable and you know pr- try and prevent housing crises that have been seen elsewhere. Uh, the party in power uh, is has criticized this move, though, so I think we're going to see some court challenges uh, against this rent freeze, and it's possible that all these renters that are paying a low amount uh, could be subject to uh, back rent if the uh, if that order has been Ooh, gets reversed that's so, a big mess that's yeah. a big mess i think uh uh that uh, germany germany is one of those countries that has a very high percentage of renters yeah absolutely it's uh it's quite high like you you hear People come here from Germany and they're renting, and they don't understand why there's a stigma against renting. I, I don't understand either. But, uh, well, I think one of the things is that they have so much rental that the renters have clout. It's, right. If they have, if there's more renters than landlords, and and they all vote, you know, they have clout. Whereas mm-hmm. in Vancouver, fifty percent of people rent. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is a long discussion, but 50% of people <laughs> rent in Vancouver, okay? So it's kind of 50-50. You've got these two forces, you know, people, right. the haves and the haves not, have-nots, right? Mm-hmm. So it's kind of balanced, whereas in, in Germany, it's uh, the, the renters have a lot of clout, and it makes sense. Why else is a government going to uh, uh, freeze the rents for 1.5 million people? people it's because mm-hmm. of this right right so if, if this resolution holds a uh, resolution by law whatever you want to call it in germany um i think that you're going to see a berlin at least berlin if not other areas too but you're going to see a housing market crash there and this might be the black swan that does it oh yeah oh yeah that's that's definitely one to watch but it's got to go through all the jump through all the hoops and uh you know so the next one is switch switcheroos. What's uh, what's? Oh yes, the switcheroos. This one's a good one. This one's a good one. Uh, so this is uh, a Facebook post, 
if you're in the Facebook groups, the real estate Facebook groups, you might have seen this one. I'm going to throw up the picture of what was sold to them, you know, the the, nice brick, the render, uh, right? The render. Nice brick facing. If you notice along the top there, you've got a nice big overhang to uh, block out the sun and keep the rain from leaking inside of your condo. And then if we look at what you're actually what you actually got, what was delivered. Yeah. It's it looks a little like, bit different. It kind of looks like insulation tacked on the outside. Yeah, yeah. It almost looks more like a school. Almost. Yes. Yeah, it yeah. almost looks more like a, a school. Um, yeah, so buyer beware. Or ha, ha, at what point do they realize, okay, you've bought into this. I'm guessing this was a, a, a force. Uh, people are buying these, not just renting them. So people bought into this brick face thing, and then mm -hmm. they got this. Uh, what do you do? Because uh, in the contract, I can guarantee there'll be lines that say, oh, we can make these adjustments along the way, you know. Yeah. It's, yeah. you know. It's depending. I did a little bit of research into this, but I'm, you know, not a financial advisor, not a lawyer. So um, they back in, I think, 2004, they introduced some new legislation because this was happening all the time. And uh, the legislation said that the builder and make changes, but they have to inform the buyer of any large material changes. So for, perhaps they've informed all these buyers and the buyers just didn't didn't care or perhaps some people did get out and then they just resold the unit. So, um, right, so it, they, you have they to be have, paying attention to your mail, right? But they get, so what they're saying is you have to tell them, but you mm -hmm. don't have to compensate them. You That's just, right. Hey, this is happening. Deal with it. Yeah. And yeah. them dealing with it is, oh, I'm okay with that change, or okay, let's flip this contract or sell it. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, I, it's, I'd be disappointed if I got this, and I, it, and I signed up for that. Okay. Oh, you've got pictures of the the. Is this the same building? The the garden. Yeah, that's the that's the garden in the back. Ooh. <laughs> okay and i'm just so, I mean, gonna... it's not not mature <laughs> no 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 no. and and i mean to be fair the render is in the summer you've got these these leafy trees that are mm -hmm. barren so that'll change but on the left hand side you've got these trees right uh in the render and if you go up well you'd never see that on that side because there's buildings there or there's a road there Right. You know, you, the render is completely deceiving. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So I think we'll end this episode on the the gif, the meme that somebody uh, put underneath that uh, post on Facebook. It's uh, the Avengers. Reality is often disappointing. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Whoever posted that, kudos. All right. That's it. Anything you want to end the episode on? Well, I think, uh, you know, if, if you have any news articles that you'd like us to cover next week, leave them in the comments below. Uh, we're always happy to see what's happening across Canada, um, and we'd love to discuss it. So, yeah, I guess this has been Not an Agent. It has. <laughs> <laughs>